So yeah, it's interesting to be part of a minority for a change. You know? Not so many French people around, right? <laughs> oh, okay. So I was wondering what, which angle I would use in order to address this issue on, on women in science here. And I will, I will share with you my obsession. My obsession is with data. And when I mean data, I mean things you measure on real people in their real lives, not the answers that you give to all the posters. Because let's put it this way. I've spent four years working in policy making uh, at the think tank of a prime minister. And what struck me is that whether we're talking about public or private organization, people spend millions each year on research. When you scratch a little bit the surface, this research is surveys, asking questions, asking people about some kind of rationalization of what they think, what they do. And the gender gap data that is floating around is not different. There is some observation of real behavior, some measures. And I will share with you some very interesting numbers on the number of PhDs on the differences between the funds and the funding that women get in science compared to men, et cetera, and the choices of career. But again, how much do we know about the true behavior, about the evidence? There are all these ideas that we have. We have beliefs. I have strong beliefs with respect to quotas, for example. But what I don't have are randomized controlled trials on thousands of people that could tell me whether this group or this region of my country or this country in Europe compared to this other country that has quotas or doesn't have quotas for women in science, for women in scientific jobs. We don't have such data. And we need such data in order to be able to say this is a good thing or this is not a bad thing. Oh, this is not a good thing. Or else. So this is where we are. We need to be able to convince governments to nudge them that in order to really make a difference, to change things, not only do we need to push for grand ideas, but we need to support these ideas with data, with evidence. Yes, I'm a firm believer in evidence-informed policy. Well, knowing things is not enough. You know, I kind of consider myself working in this area of behavior change having uh, the great opportunity to have some of the world-famous uh, uh, scientists on uh, gender and threat stereotypes in my lab. I will share some of the experiments with you in a few minutes to be quite informed. Yet, when I got the invitation from Annalisa, my first reaction was, women's fair, great. Then I was in the room and I looked around and I say, whoa, I'm the only man. Actually, I was told I was the only man by a woman. And I was thinking, well, what if I had said the same thing? But again, it was interesting to be the minority, me as a Caucasian, straight male, which is supposed to be the less discriminated category of people on Earth so far. This will change, but so far not. So me having the data, me being informed about that, well, yet I was having some kind of very stereotypical behavior. And we're all like that, including women in science. I strongly advise you, if you're interested in this issue, to read the issue of March 7 of Nature magazine that is dedicated to women in science, where women in science share that they are biased against other women in science, as revealed by implicit tests. You can run them on the Harvard website, go to Implicit Harvard, and you will uh, go through a series of questions where the time you take to answer is measured and you get data out of it. And interestingly enough, Jennifer Raymond in this issue starts her paper by sharing her experience running this test and realizing that yes, Ultimately, she realized running the test that she was associating science to men more than to women, which is what we have. So some of the facts that we can find in this issue are really, really interesting. For example, 
female recipients of doctoral degrees in Europe, in science. Lithuania, 63%. This was in, 90, in 2006. Italy, 52%. Spain, 48 Belgium, 40 UK, 38 France, 37 Germany, 35 The Netherlands, 29 Gender gap among scientists in European universities. Doctoral recipients, overall, 64% of male. Junior faculty, 67% of male. Senior faculty, 89%. Numbers. Numbers. So what can we do? We've heard about ways to counter the biases, ways to counter the threat. When to do it? We've got some evidence on that. But what is interesting is that there is also data that can be misinterpreted because I've been advocating collecting evidence. But if you don't use it the proper way, it can backlash. For example, if you take maths, and if you consider maths is science, this can be debated at the epistemological level, but this is not the, the place. Well, there is, in the general population, one cannot observe Overall, some differences in some grades between boys and girls. And some girls are aware of that. In spite of being aware that there is no differences in the grades, they suffer the, the, the stereotype threat. The issue with, with teachers, it was addressed as well. And those teachers that have numbers showing them that there is no difference, they think there is no difference. Yes, there is no difference in score, but there is a difference in the threat, in handling the threat. Let me give you an example. So as I told you, I'm working with Pascal Huguet and Isabelle Regnier, and they've been um, running a lot of behavioral experiments, social psychology for the most, on this issue of maths and kids. And what is really interesting is uh, they have this very simply designed experiment from outside where they, they ask boys and girls in randomized groups to perform a task. The task is quite simple, uh, again, from the outside. There is a very complex geometrical figure that they need to reproduce, and there is a way to grade the level to which you succeed in reproducing it. So on one group, of kids, they say, we're going to do geometry. The results reveal that the boys score quite high and the girls lower. They gave the exact same task to another group saying, we're going to do a drawing task. The performance of the boys remained unchanged, but the performance of the girls was higher than the performance of the boys. One word the exact same task. One word was changed. And with this word, they managed to improve dramatically the performance of the little girls. Can you imagine how important it is to train people on which words to use when they're teaching to kids? Yes, it's crucial. So that is one example of a behavioral inter intervention that we can coin a nudge, which is, uh, for those who've read the book by uh, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein, an approach of, uh, that is based on small changes in the environment, whether physical, whether social, that favors the adoption of a behavior that improves the health and well-being of people. Which brings us to the well-being issue. I was quite happy sitting um, here earlier to hear that female leaders make the same mistakes as male leaders. The first one being thinking that everyone in the world wants to be a leader. Yeah, newsflash, some people don't really care. Yeah, really, they don't care. Some people just want to be happy. So yes, it's fantastic to hear about the Marissas, the Cheryls and alike. We need more of them to set examples that they can conquer the world, that they have grand goals. But these grand goals for a lot of people, they are very hard to achieve. And being inspired by some of the work we did in policy making, 
on fighting obesity. We first thought that in order to entice people into losing weight and getting uh, more active, we needed some Olympic athletes, the top of the top. But the goal to reach for the obese people was too, way too far. We had better results with overweight people set as models. What I mean is that, yes, we need some overachievers to be shown to our daughters, to my daughters. But just in case these girls just want to lead a happy life without ruling the world, it's also super important to promote what leaders consider normal people, average people, whatever that means. Just to set goals that they can reach. And maybe if you set a goal that you can reach, you reach this goal, there is another one and another one and another one. And you go more gradual. Not this kind of cold shower, big hitting punch in the face by saying, this is, yeah, shoot for the stars. You know what? Shoot for a small hill first, then climb the first hill, then shoot for a big mountain, and from the big mountain, try to shoot for the star. That can work too. So again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we don't need to hear about the great leaders and the achievers. I want to hear more stories about that. I want to share more stories about these women with my daughters. But what I want to share with them is also the stories of Jane Doe's that are just happy to live, just happy to be teachers, happy not to have to deal with 80,000 people because they're ahead of HR worldwide as one of our uh, fellow young global leaders of, uh, of the World Economic Forum. And I strongly advise uh, a, a book by another young global leader, Lisa Witte, um, called The She Spot, that addresses issues like that. It's really important if we want to favor women in science, women in society, to talk to every woman, not just to consider that the example, the way to go is to be a leader. I come from a country where there is no word for leadership. Seriously, I don't know what it means. <laughs> and when I hear people calling themselves leaders, it rings, you know, for me it goes like a person who chooses his or her nickname. You don't decide to be called Iceman. People do it. For me, leadership is something emergent. Okay, some people decide to be leaders and they become, and that's great, but there are other people who decide to do things. And these things might not be relevant on the scale of, I don't know, MBAs and things like that, but they are super important for our society. And science is one of these things. We can have women in science that have major impact. I think you might have heard of uh, Madame Merkel in Germany, former physicist. Science can lead to many things. So again, it is important to first look at real people in order to understand how they behave, what they need, whether we're talking about science or not. Speaking about science, it's interesting that uh, whether we're talking science policy, health policy, etc., everything is more or less set by economists at the government level. The advisors are economists and lawyers. When you look, my, my, my big problem with classical and standard economists is they have no clue about what a real human being is, including the fact that they're old men and they're women. One of the proofs is that there is only one woman who received the uh, Nobel, Economic, uh, you know, Nobel Prize for Economics. Right, that was an easy one, but again, we need to consider for science real behavior of real people. So, my guess, my wish is uh, to convince you to spread the word to people around, to governments, to leaders that you know and that you are, that we need to understand the behavior of people, of scientists, and run more science on women in science in order to have more women in science. Because the one thing where academia, for once, is just like the private sector, is in this imbalance between men and women at every level, and the fact that, yes, we know too that with more women in science, 
just like what Warren Buffett said, in, and that can be considered in terms of economy and society, we will have more results. Thank you very much.